So good afternoon, everybody. I'm Dr. Collins. My name is Dr. Jessica Collins. I'm a podiatrist or a foot and ankle surgeon. I work for Mercer Bucks Orthopedics. And today I'm gonna to be talking to you about bunions and hammer toes. Um, just a nice discussion on digital deformities. It's one of the most common things that I see between the bunions and the hammer toes, and they're the most common digital deformities. So just an outline of what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to give you a little background. We'll go over um, the physical exam side of things, what, what a clinical evaluation entails, what are the diagnostic studies that we look at, uh, what treatments are available, what your recovery time is if you do have any specific treatments, and then we'll just summarize everything. And uh, like Jen was just saying, at the end, we'll have a question and answer. So to begin, I wanted to give you guys some background. I think the, the most logical question is really, what is a bunion and what is a hammer toe? I did mention that they are very common, so they are the most common digital deformities. They can very broadly be classified into a bunion versus a hammer toe, dependent on uh, which digits are involved. A bunion and a hammer toe, um, they are both bone and joint disorders. Um, they are most commonly driven by an imbalance of the soft tissue, but it's the bone itself um, that is involved. They present as painful contracted joints. Um, occasionally you will see calluses with them or you may see it without calluses. And the reason that you do develop calluses is because you ultimately have a deformed structure of the digit, which leads to extra pressure and rubbing. This is just a somewhat of a summarized diagram um, describing symptoms related to a bunion, but this is also applicable to hammer toes. So, and at the top, you can see it says a bunion is a bony bump at the base of the big toe. You can see in this picture here that this patient is pointing to the side of the big toe. That's the most common location. You will be experiencing pain, it's on the side. So aside from pain, other symptoms include numbness, um, a burning sensation, overall foot pain. A lot of times the skin will look red and inflamed, and then you can have that hardened skin or corner callus, and then it can also um, get to the point where you even have difficulty putting weight down and walking normally. So the next logical discussion here after you have a basic understanding of what it really is, it's a, a, a joint disease, a bone and joint disease affected by the soft tissue. It's really important to understand the anatomy. And I've always found it very fascinating how similar our hands are to our feet. And I constantly use my hands to show patients and demonstrate how similar it is to the feet and just um, to demonstrate joints in general. Um, our hands, we have our thumb and our four fingers, very similar in the feet. You have your great toe or your hallux, and then you have the four lesser digits. So again, the first toe is known as the hallux or the great toe. And then the second through the fifth digit is known as a lesser toe. Um, the way that we identify bunions and hammer toes or any real digital deformity, deformity part of me, is based on what joints are involved. Um, here you can somewhat see that there are multiple joints within our toes. You can see the same thing on your hands. If you bend your finger, you see multiple bends because you have multiple joints to the finger itself. So a little bit more about anatomy. I did mention we have our hallux or great toe and then our lesser digits. And in these pictures down here, we'll start with the hammer toes. You can see the bony surfaces here and the joints where the bones articulate. I wanted to show this picture because you can see that there are multiple joints involved in digital deformities. And it's important to identify which ones are involved. It could be just one, it could be all three joints involved. On the big toe, what really separates it from our lesser toes, very similar to the thumb, is that you only have two main joints that can be involved, pardon me. On the lesser digit, you can see that there are three joints that can be involved. And that's key in the deformity itself and um, ultimately how we're gonna treat it. So who is affected by this and why? Um, bunions and hammer toes, again, I can't say enough, are very common. And the way that they develop, it's really multifactorial. Um, there's a lot of debate amongst physicians, amongst the literature, and just in science on whether or not it's more so genetically driven or is it our environment, such as shoes. Um, really, it is multiple factors and all those factors considered um, that result in a digital deformity. But uh, very consistently, no matter how it really comes about, the number one contributing factor to getting a digital deformity is a loss of balance between the tendons around the different joints. This picture I included because 
I, I find that a lot of times we don't always appreciate how complex our digits are, just the anatomy of it. Um, you can see here the three joints of a digit and then around it, and this is a side view by the way, but around it, around the joint rather, you have ligament structures and then you have tendons that are supporting those joints. So you can see just from this picture how it is quite complex to, to really understand and, and see the anatomy of the digit. So who is most affected? Um, I did you know, mention, I mentioned that. So it's females. Female patients tend to be um, seen more likely with a bunion versus a hammer toe, though males can be affected. And most commonly you see it in the fifth to seventh decade. Um, here's a little more on that uh, debate that I mentioned, whether it's genetics versus the environment. Genetic factors or intrinsic factors, meaning you're born with it, include things such as neuromuscular disorders or diseases, um, also congenital deformities, meaning deformities that you were born with or perhaps you developed because of birth, and then also your foot type or foot structure, pardon me, which is very strongly driven by your genetics. Extrinsic factors include outside influences. Like I mentioned, there's shoes, injuries, or if you had a previous surgery. Shoes are, are really one of the most common uh, factors that can influence development of a bunion. You may have this genetic predisposition to developing bunions and hammer toes because say somebody in your family had it. Um, and then on top of it, if you do wear poorly fitted shoes, um, then you're just that much more likely to develop a bunion. Um, there is the recommendation typically that heels should not be more than three inches. Um, some people might say two inches, but the higher the heel, the more pressure you end up putting on the big toe and the lesser toes. This picture right here I thought was an excellent picture just because it shows how when you're weight bearing on an even surface, how 90% of your body weight is distributed through the heel with 10% to the front of the foot. When you're in a heel, a heeled shoe like this, you can see that a much larger percentage of your body weight is now distributed to the digits, thus enabling um, the joint to splay and move and that leads to the development of deformity. Now that you have a little bit of a background, I did say I wanted to take you through the clinical evaluation or what's the next step. Um, now you have a little bit better understanding of your feet, of your digits, so now what do you do? you go to your doctor and you get checked out. So with a clinical exam or what you can expect uh, when you go see the doctor is a, a history will be taken. Um, I'm sure most of us have been to the doctor and you realize this, but I wanted to just uh, include this because I think it's important for patients to understand that giving a, a very thorough and complete history is essential. It really can help identify um, contributing factors. It can help with preventative medicine. It can help dictate treatment as well. So always be very forthcoming and, and give a thorough and complete history. Um, once you know your your full background is given, we assess different things such as your family history, any past medical history or surgical history that you have. Family history is important because genetics, genetics play a key role. Uh, also any familial diseases that can impact the digits and the feet are important to know because that helps identify your risk, also helps dictate treatment. In terms of the past medical history, past surgical history, if you've ever had any surgery that affects the lower extremity, that could be the knee, the hip, that could also include the back, but any previous surgery can ultimately affect the feet. Anything that's gonna affect the way that we walk, that's gonna distribute pressure differently, can affect our feet. So you definitely wanna include any surgeries that you've had. Um, other things that can um, affect uh, our feet and lead to digital deformities are things that I did mention, nerve disorders. Um, also, if you have any history or uh, in your family or you yourself of systemic arthropathies, examples of that are rheumatoid arthritis or psoriatic arthritis. Diabetes certainly can affect the feet and our foot structure. Um, and then if you've ever had any trauma, that certainly can affect our feet and our feet structure. And that's trauma is stemming through childhood. So even if you haven't had a recent trauma, it's important to relate any traumas that you've had because ultimately that can affect your feet and can lead to deformity. So once we get through the history part, the next thing is our physical exam. So with physical exam, um, we're looking at the foot and touching the foot, feeling the joints, manipulating the joints, assessing how much range of motion is there. Um, ultimately, we're looking at bunions and hammer toes and classifying them based on their severity. There are many different classification systems out there for hammer toes, types of hammer toes, bunions, severity of bunions, but the most simplistic way and somewhat universal way is classifying based on the severity. 
this is a very simple picture that you can see. And um, there's a picture of a normal foot here. And then you can see as the stages of a bunion progress, you start to see that prominence become more proud on the side. So the severity is dictating the stage. Um, with that being said, the initial presentation um, I did allude to is typically pain. Uh, you might have a bump on the side of the foot. You might have um, some redness and calluses. That's typically how it initially presents. Again, progressing the calluses. And then from there, it, the joint itself and the digit just becomes more rigid and more contracted. And then ultimately the joints around that joint become more painful and contracted. In this picture, you can see there are two obvious deformities. There's a bunion and then there's a crossover toe. There can be argument on which came first because adjacent joints do work together, but it is very common to see when you have a progressive deformity, whether it is a, a very proud bunion or a very contracted curled toe, that ultimately the toes next to it are affected. So the physical exam itself should always be performed um, standing and seated. The, the reason for that is because it's important to truly see the way that your joints open up, the way that your digits sit when you're in a standing position. If you were to lift your foot off the ground and just look at your toes, you would probably see some curling because that's the natural position of the tendons in their relaxed positions. When you stand up, the joints splay to their, their standing position, and that just gives a better idea of the type of deformity that's there and it helps dictate treatment. Um, it is important not just to assess where the pain is, but also to assess the extremity overall. Um, that's really doing a thorough exam, doing a gait exam, watching the patient walk, um, and ultimately just assessing the lower extremity entirely. There are many contributing factors from other parts of the body that can lead to digital deformity and can lead to pain in the feet. Um, examples of that are if you have any uh, tightness in your calf muscle, um, in your thighs, that's going to translate to our ankle and ultimately to our feet. If there's any excess internal or external, external part of me rotation of the hip or knee, that's certainly going to translate downward. Um, and then also if there's any unequal limb length between the two sides, that will also translate. I did mention this before that adjacent joints work together and that's that's really demonstrating this principle. If anything's going on in the hips or the knees, our center of gravity changes and the way that we distribute weight changes and ultimately that affects our feet. The reason this is so important is because if you're only to assess and treat right where the pain is, there's a really high likelihood that the, um, the issue is just gonna reoccur if you don't address the, the causative factors or other factors contributing. So again, I, I can't say it enough, both standing and seated exams are really important. Um, also with your exam, we're identifying your foot type. The type of, your foot type rather, the type of foot you have is really important to know because if you have a really low arch versus a high arch, that's gonna ultimately affect the digits. It's going to um, increase chances of recurrence of deformities. And so it's important to, to assess the foot overall. Um, pronation or a flat foot is probably the most common cause of digital deformity. Almost always, especially um, as life progresses, as you progress, when you have a flat foot, ultimately you get translation of deformity to the toes. Um, which digits and which joints are involved? I did you know, go over that the digital anatomy is different between a smaller toe and our great toe. So it is important to identify which joints are involved, which toes are involved. And then also in determining, is it a flexible deformity? Meaning when you um, pull on the toe or try to straighten it out, does it actually reduce? Or is it a rigid deformity? When you try to straighten the toe out, is it contract? This is very important because it dictates treatment um, and also uh, dictates recovery time even. So uh, a little closer look here, specifically at the deformities we're gonna talk about today. So lesser or small toe deformities um, can come about in, in multiples or it can be an isolated deformity. So you could have all of your little toes affected. You could have just one toe affected every other toe affected even. Um, it just depends on all the factors that I mentioned. You can classify a hammer toe or a digital deformity into really three main categories. And those categories are classified based on what joints are involved. So hammer toe is the classic um, description that we use for any curled toe, but really a hammer toe only involves the joint, the knuckle joint rather, um, that's the larger joint over the toe. You can see that there's also buckling at this joint and there's also buckling at this joint, but the apex of the deformity, um, the, the real source of pain tends to be the knuckle joint 
that's um, the larger joint of our toe. So the, the one that's closer to your foot. When you have a claw toe deformity, you have buckling of the joints that are both close to the foot and also closer to the tip of the toe. And then when you have a mallet toe, a mallet toe, it, if you look at it, it looks like a mallet, um, but it's at the tip of the toe, at the very tip of the toe you have curling, which creates almost that mallet looking structure. Um, so it's just the joint that's towards the tip. With a great toe deformity or a, a hallux deformity, the most common that we see is hallux abducto valgus, HAV. Um, that's a big fancy word to just to describe a classic bunion. The reason that you have these, these multi-phrased uh, deformities here is because these deformities occur in multiple planes. Um, there are other types of great toe or bunion deformities, but for um, completion's sake, I, I included them. I will not be going into great detail of, with hallux limitus, hallux malleus, and hallux ferris. Here you can see in these two pictures, hallux valgus traditionally presents as bump pain on the side and perhaps tops of the, the top of the foot, pardon me. When you have a hallux limitus or rigidus, which is really decreased motion at the big toe joint leading to progressive arthritis, you tend to have dorsal pain or a dorsal bunion, pain on the top of the toe. So that's like a, a really key difference. You also get bony spurring around the joint um, and it's more so a progressive arthritis than just playing of the joint. So once you have your physical exam completed, um, the most important step is to review some diagnostic studies. The gold standard is x-ray or radiographs. X-rays, and I can't, I can't emphasize this enough, I know there's multiple points I keep saying that for, but with x-rays, they must be weight-bearing in order to truly describe a bunion. Um, the reason for that is because you need to see the way that the joints are structured and the way that the joints splay when you walk. Because ultimately, walking is what induces this pain and progresses this deformity, so you need to see the structures when you're in that position. If you are gonna consider surgery, always make sure that you had a weight bearing um, x-ray that was evaluated first. Because the last thing that anybody wants is to, is to go through surgery and come to find out perhaps a poor procedure was chosen um, because the x-rays weren't read appropriately or the proper x-rays weren't done. Other types of um, advanced imaging, other types of diagnostics, such as an MRI or a CT scan, are really rarely required when it comes to digit deformities, such as bunions and hammer toes. However, it can help us. It, it can help um, give us a better idea of a patient's bone quality or bone stock, which is important in choosing any type of hardware that patient might need, or, and also in dictating um, their recovery or their um, post-op course. Also, if you're concerned that there could be any ligament issues, um, any ligaments that can be contributing to the deformity, then occasionally an MRI is warranted. This picture right here um, really demonstrates how important it is to have a weight-bearing x-ray. There are some specific angles drawn out here that we draw out on x-rays when we're assessing bunions, and it's important to understand what these angles are, how large these angles are, because it, it tells us where the deformity is, how severe the deformity is, and it helps us determine what treatment is best suited for the patient. So now what? Really, the next step is to talk about treatment, but also prevention. Prevention is really important. Um, when, it, when we're starting to go down the treatment path, you could go either way when it comes to surgery or conservative measures, but ultimately conservative treatment should always be considered first. So conservative treatment when it comes to bunions and hammer toes is really better suited typically if it's early, but it can also really provide symptomatic relief. So if say you're not a surgical candidate, you don't wanna talk about surgery, you can certainly get relief with a lot of conservative measures that are available. Um, without surgery, you can't truly realign the joint um, because it is a bone and joint disorder. So that's just something to think about and I'll talk about um, as we progress through this. So uh, other thoughts on conservative measures are the, the initial a logarithm that um, I typically implement with patients is something called price therapy. And this is for any inflammation anywhere in the foot, the ankle and the lower extremity, um, protecting it. So keeping off of it, whether that's shoes that's irritating you, just protecting the area that's uncomfortable, patting it off, um, resting it. 
ice can be really beneficial, not just in um, helping reduce swelling if there is any, but also it numbs the skin um, and it helps with those superficial nerves that can be really painful. Compression is also very important. Swelling is always something that we face in the lower extremity just because of the nature of our bodies and because of gravity. Your feet are all the way down there, your heart's all the way up here. So compression is something that not only provides support around the joints and the muscles, but it helps eliminate a certain level of swelling. And swelling is something that can cause further pain and stiffness around joints. Elevation is also important. Um, it, that helps decrease swelling and it also um, just helps overall with pain and discomfort. If you've been on your feet all day, if you have really achy feet, I'm sure you know getting home, propping those feet up, elevating, it makes a huge difference. So other thoughts for conservative measures, again, always should be considered first. Um, shoes, I mentioned shoes. Shoes are really important when it comes to the toes. Um, it's important not to have a super narrow shoe um, and also to have arch support. I included this picture here because you don't necessarily have to change your shoes. Perhaps you can um, provide that support to your foot by adding something into the shoe. So an orthotic is something that you wear, it goes under your foot, it typically fits in your shoe and it provides arch support. In supporting the arch of our foot, we ultimately offload the toes and take pressure off of the toes. So it is important, even though you don't have pain, perhaps you don't have pain in the arch itself, um, perhaps you don't have any real foot pain outside of just a toe or a hammer toe, um, a bunion. It is important though to provide support to the arch because again, that drives the pressure to the front of our foot. The other thought too I have here is special pads can be incorporated and that's true with orthotics you can also incorporate pads into it that take extra pressure off of the front of the foot. So if you were to obtain, say, an over-the-counter insert, which there are many excellent products out there, put it in your shoe, it might help your toe pain, but you might get even uh, more help if you added extra padding by the toes. So that's something that with orthotics, you can incorporate into them um, when you have a custom orthotic versus something over-the-counter. Shoe, shoe, shoes. Um, I have shoe discussions every day because shoes are so important. They not only protect our feet, um, but they, they take pressure off of our feet and they help in prevention um, of digital deformities. So I always get asked this question, what sneakers are the best sneakers or what shoes are the best shoes? I, I also hate to tell patients never, you can never wear heels, you know. It's, to me, it's all about moderation. Um, sneakers wise, in a walking shoe is usually the very best. If you go to purchase a new pair of shoes, you'll see there are tons of models out there. Um, you'll see this is for a supinator, this is for a pronator, and it can get really confusing, even overwhelming to know which shoes what, and some of these shoes are really expensive. So the last thing you wanna do is go and get this really specialized shoe and it doesn't do anything for you or it makes you feel worse. So a really kind of simple way to think about it is a nice structured walking shoe will support your foot overall um, and it's the simplest way to get the best shoe for your foot. Um, it helps bring your foot to a more neutral position so that you don't have extra pressure um, either on either side of the foot, pardon me, or on the digits itself. In this picture you can see that this patient has a sneaker on one side and a heel on the other side, um, just kind of showing it, this looks like this person, you know, might be able to walk in this position, but it's so unlikely you'd ever be able to do that. Um, when your heel is up this high, just naturally all of your pressure goes to your toes and goes to um, the, the first uh, joint here, which then causes splaying in a bunion. The other uh, thing here is shoes. You don't, I, I want to emphasize that you don't always have to purchase new shoes because that's something that I think, you know, is, is a discussion I have on a regular basis and it's important for patients to understand. I certainly don't want anyone to feel like, oh, great, now I have to go buy all new shoes or anything. And sometimes you, you don't have the means to do so. So there are a lot of things that um, you can get relatively inexpensive that provide external support. So you don't have to get new shoes. You can get toe sleeves, pads, um, spacers, and materials matter. Um, the reason I mention that is because there are many different types of shoes and pads out there. Um, a lot of times I find that these newer sneakers that are coming out, they're more low profile, they weigh less, so they have more of like mesh structure to them, but ultimately they're giving you no true structure around your feet. So definitely the materials of the shoe matter because you want to have enough stability to support the joints and bring that foot to the most neutral position possible. More about shoes, I did mention about moderation. And again, I, I'm not one to say you can never wear heels over two or three inches, but 
realize if you do wear heels over two or three inches, the best thing to do is not to wear them repetitively day um, after day. If you do wear a shoe that is more narrow fitting, that is higher on the heel, certainly the following day, it is best to wear a more structured shoe where you're in a more neutral position and definitely stretching your toes, stretching your calf muscle, and just really kind of going intermittently between a dress shoe and a more structured shoe. Um, ultimately, if you work in a job or just for life purposes, you can wear a more structured shoe at all times, hey, that is the best thing for you. But I do understand that sometimes you work in a job where you have to wear specific shoes and you feel you don't have a lot of choices. So it is all about moderation and then working with what you have by offloading and adding pads. In this picture here on the side, you can see how a narrow shoe affects the feet. Obviously, if you have something really narrow around the toes, it's gonna push all of the toes together. Similar in this picture here, when you have a super narrow pointy heel, all the toes are smushed together here. As you get to a wider toe box, you have more uh, room between, between the toes and you don't have as much rubbing. That's less chance of developing calluses, less pressure on the joints, um, and also less compensation. When you have a tight fitting shoe and you're not able to really move your toes or move your foot the way that you're supposed to move it, you compensate at other joints such as the ankle and vice versa. If you have anything going on in the ankle, you compensate at the feet because like I said, adjacent joints work together. So a little bit more about orthotics. Orthotics, there are many types of orthotics out there. There are over-the-counter orthotics versus custom orthotics. I mentioned that there are a lot of really great brands. There are a lot of really good orthotic options out there. Um, a custom orthotic, the benefit of it is that you can customize it. You can add pads. You can make them of different lengths. Um, you can make them more of a cushion or more of a structured fit based on the patient's foot type and based on the deformity, also based on patient preferences. An over-the-counter insert, the way that you can really tell if it's a good product is, and I always encourage patients to do this, is take it out of the box. If you can take that insert and just flip it around, compress it, squeeze it, it's not doing much for you. It's definitely just going to provide cushioning. It's not going to really realign the joints. So you want the arch portion of it to be pretty rigid and hard. And a lot of times that um, pushes patients away from using orthotics because they think they're going to be uncomfortable or they had some sort of experience where they were really uncomfortable. But the most important thing is to listen to your body and break them in because it is something really structured that perhaps you're not used to under your foot. So you certainly can't put it in your shoe and then expect that you're going to be pain free. There is a great chance that it might work right away for you, but for certain people, it's going to be a little uncomfortable and you should always um, have a break in period because of that. So conservative measures, again, always first. Um, I get asked about these devices a lot. Um, there are many different types of devices out there that can take pressure off of the toes. I've mentioned some of them. There are offloading pads, there are toe spacers, there's also taping of the toes, strapping of the toes, and then another um, conservative measure is anti-inflammatory therapy. Just wanted to show a couple pictures here. Um, here is an example in here of a toe spacer. Um, if you went online, if you went to Amazon, Googled it, there are tons of options for toe spacers and sleeves with the ultimate goal of preventing rubbing between toes and from rubbing from shoes um, to prevent pain and prevent calluses from forming. These are examples of uh, bunion straps. There are many different types of these out there. Really with a bunion strap, it is unlikely that it's going to make a significant difference in the actual structure of the foot because the bones and joints are involved, especially if you've had your deformity for some time. If it's very early on, it might make a difference because it does take pressure off of the, the joint itself. But ultimately, you can't wear a device like this 24 hours a day because it won't fit in your shoes. Um, and it, it's just not realistic. It wouldn't be comfortable. Um, so the second you're not wearing it and you're just walking and living in your daily life, that structure is just going to return to its deformed position. So these typically don't work that well, but I have had people that swear by it and say that they get a lot of relief from different bunion straps um, and sleeves um, and bunion braces. So anti-inflammatory treatment, that's um, part of the resting, icing, compression, elevation, and um, also anti-inflammatories. Anti-inflammatories include um, two main classes of medications. There's the non-steroid anti-inflammatories, and then there's the steroid 
um, group of, of medications. There's also injectables. So you can do an injection of a steroid. And also there are um, other types of injections out there, such as biologic injections, which include things like amniotic injections, stem cells, and then platelet-rich plasma. Um, this is a, just a picture of um, an injection being performed at the joint here. Typically, if you are going to have an injection around a painful bunion or around a digit, it is done through the top of the foot. That is something that is asked pretty commonly. Um, I've had many patients that have had bad experiences with injections on the bottom of the feet. The skin at the bottom of our feet, just like the, the, the palms of our hand, pardon me, is thicker and it just can be more uncomfortable to do any injection through the bottom of the foot. So almost always for injections, we're going through the top or the side of the foot. Here are just some pictures somewhat demonstrating what stem cell therapy and platelet-rich plasma consist of. With stem cell therapy, you're ultimately drawing fluid and bone marrow from a bone in your body you're spinning that down, and then you're taking the specialized cells and injecting them around joints. Um, with platelet-rich plasma, it's similar in that you're using your body's own fluid, you're um, drawing blood, you're spinning that blood down, you're getting rid of the cells that you don't need, and you're extracting the cells that you do need, the platelet-rich plasma, which is full of growth factors and anti-inflammatory factors, and then you inject that where the pain is. So treatment-wise, conservatively, Something else that's important is exercise and physical therapy. Exercise wise, um, just keeping a balance between the muscles and the tendons is really important. If you have a really tight calf muscle, then the muscles at the anterior portion of your, of your foot and leg, the front of your foot and leg are ultimately gonna be compensating. So it's all about strengthening adjacent muscle groups, strengthening the tendons and the muscles around the joints that are painful um, that helps alleviate the pressure off of the joints and stop the progression of deformity. So what do we do when we've tried all these things and nothing, nothing's helping? Surgery, unfortunately, is the next step. Surgery is something that um, I found so many people uh, have heard stories about when it comes to bunions and hammer toes. There's just a lot of mixed information on the internet about it. Very classically, you hear how painful somebody's recovery was um, from bunion surgery. And so I really don't want to, to perpetuate that. I don't want anybody to be nervous about bunion surgery. Surgery is surgery. Is it painful? Is it uncomfortable? Typically, yes, you do have a period of pain but I find it's important to realize every patient needs to be treated as an individual. It's important to have a thorough discussion with your doctor and just to prepare yourself um, in knowing what you're, what you're going into. I find that if you go into anything thoroughly prepared of what you know, to expect afterwards, it makes a very big difference. So I'm a very big proponent of patient education and patients taking their education into their own hands really, which is why I commend everybody today for attending this and just wanting to learn more. So that's really important when it comes to any treatment and just understanding your body in general. Um, surgically, uh, there are two main divisions in surgery that I just noted here. Um, there's soft tissue versus bony procedures. So with surgery, Again, it depends on the x-rays. I have pushed that a little bit today, but x-rays are so important when it comes to bunion surgery. Um, with bunions, and this is a, I want this lecture to serve more as an overview because some of this stuff can get very complex. And then I, of course, will answer any questions, but bunion surgery can very broadly be separated into two main categories. There's proximal procedures, which I'll explain, and then there's distal procedures. You can address a bunion with a soft tissue procedure alone. However, you almost always have to do some sort of bony work, otherwise it will end up recurring. And I'll talk a little bit more about that too. With hammer toes, because they are, they are similar structures, the lesser toes, but they're different and different joints are involved, soft tissue procedures can help alone with a hammer toe. However, bone is almost always needed to be addressed as well because by the time you're experiencing pain and discomfort, the joint is typically uh, contracted at that point, and so you need to do something to address that. In bunion surgery, there's two main types of surgery. There's pinning, and then there's also implants. So with any surgical intervention, whether it's to uh, address a bunion or it's to address a hammer toe, the goal is to realign the digit and the joints into the proper position because ultimately they're out of alignment. 
you look at this picture, it's a very sim uh, simple picture. This is a bump on the side of the foot with this toe abutting the second toe. The goal of surgery is to eliminate the bump and to bring the toe back over where it's supposed to be. And similar for a hammer toe, you want to eliminate any bumps, whether it's something on the top of the toe, on the top of the knuckle, and realign the digit to its proper position. The recovery is very much going to be dictated by the severity of the deformity. As you have a, as your deformity progresses, as you have a worsening deformity, uh, correction ends up needing to be more, and then that ends up resulting in a longer recovery. So it makes sense. You have a very contracted digit, you have a very progressive deformity, all of your toes are curled, it's going to take a lot longer for you to recover because you're going to need a lot more correction. So again, soft tissue procedures for a bunion alone are associated with a really high recurrence risk. So we tend to focus on bony procedures such as a proximal versus a distal bone procedure. So what that means is a proximal procedure is something closer to the midfoot or the middle of our foot, okay? So that means that your bunion deformity, and this is a nice side picture of the foot, here's some top pictures here, you're, the reason that you're getting this painful bump is coming from this area, a joint closer to our midfoot, okay? Sometimes there are, you have a deformity that is less severe per x-rays. It's really encompassed around this joint or perhaps this joint. If that's the case, then you do a distal procedure or a procedure closer to the toe itself. This diagram somewhat demonstrates a basic soft tissue with mild bone work procedure. And this again is a very simplistic picture, but this is a, a picture of an x-ray of a bunion deformity. You can see this big toe is pushing up against the second toe. You have this proud bump on the side. The reason that this toe is splayed is because of soft tissue imbalance around it. There is a ligament structure, there are several ligament structures and tendons that help balance this joint. So when you do soft tissue procedures, you ultimately are rebalancing the soft tissue on the sides of the digit so that it can lay straight. And when you have a proud, prominent, painful bump, you're eliminating that bump by sawing away the excess bone on the side. Oftentimes, this is a temporary fix because you're not truly addressing the deformity from the bony standpoint. Yes, you shaved the bump off, but you didn't truly address the joint itself so the bump can recur. So proximal procedures or the procedure that's closer to the foot, we'll start out talking about that. It's indicated for a moderate to a severe deformity. This is an x-ray of a very severe bone. You can see this bone is all the way hanging out over here with this toe there. And you'll see for comparison a different x-ray this is considered a severe deformity. This is a really good example of an x-ray um, that shows a foot that would require a proximal procedure because you can see that this joint is splaying from all the way back here. When you have a proximal procedure, a more severe deformity, you ultimately have a longer recovery period. Typically, you have a minimum of four weeks non-weight bearing, followed by progressive weight bearing in a boot before transitioning back to sneakers. Um, ultimately, you almost always require physical therapy and you don't begin that till week six. Next is a distal procedure or moderate deformity. I don't want to flip back and forth too much between these two x-rays, but you can see here clearly there's not as much splaying here at this joint. So a distal procedure I mentioned closer to the toe, that's where the deformity is, mild to moderate deformity. There is less of a recovery period, but you're still looking at a total of six weeks before you're even getting back into sneakers. A better look at why these x-rays matter so much and why I you know, emphasize that multiple times here. This is a great comparison showing side by side the two x-rays that I mentioned and demonstrating how important it is to get an x-ray. So here's our great toe and here's where that joint splaying so much back here versus here the apex of the deformity or where it's coming from is more closer to the toe. I'm going to go back, warranting a distal procedure or something closer to the toe as seen here by these screws and you can see there's no longer a proud bump. So moving forward, um, after thinking about the bunion side of things, it's important for us next to address hammer toes. 
So with hammer toes, I mentioned there are three main types. There's a hammer toe, a claw toe, a mallet toe. Really varies depending on um, where the deformity is, and that's going to dictate the treatment. You can fix a hammer toe deformity if it's not rigid or really progressive with just soft tissue, meaning you go in and you balance the soft tissue on either side of the joint so that it lays straight. But very often, you need to address the bone as well, and that's done by actually removing all or part of the joint. Once you remove all or part of the joint, the joint itself is floppy at that point because you don't have that bone contact anymore because you release part of the bone. So in order for the digit to stay straight and for that deformity not just to come right back or that toe to curl or that toe not to function and um, be a floppy toe, you have to do something to hold it in place. So that's either using a pin or an implant. I gave um, this simple picture just because I thought it, it very clearly showed. You have a corn that's over this joint. You remove that painful joint and the corn and you pin it in place. Um, moving forward with hammer toe surgery. With hammer toes, after you've really identified the type of hammer toe it is, you've identified where the deformity is, what's causing the deformity, you chose your, your surgical approach, whether it's implants or pinning, um, you move forward um, in the recovery process. So an implant is typically not removed at all, but a pin has to be removed. So I want to go back and show the pin itself is ultimately going to be exiting the toe and it's going to stay there for several weeks, um, which does add to the recovery period. I'm sure you can imagine when you have a pin that's sticking out of the toe, you can't get it wet for prolonged periods of time and you have to thoroughly monitor it because you want to prevent any complications associated with that pin. The pin ultimately comes out at around four weeks. It depends on the deformity. This is again a very simplistic overview, but the pin may come out as early as two weeks, but it may stay in for up to four weeks. Once the pin is out, you are still recovering till that six, six week period, pardon me, um, when you are then going to start to return to shoes and you're going to begin um, the recovery process with therapy. So what to expect post-op? I somewhat alluded to this, but digital swelling is very severe after a uh, foot surgery or after an injury even. But again, it's gravity, it's anatomy, and um, you had surgery, your foot hangs down, even if you're really good at elevating it, like you see in this picture, it's a great patient elevating their post-op um, splint, have their crutches right there. But even if you are elevating it, it's nearly impossible to keep your foot at the level of your heart or over your heart for a prolonged period of time. So there's always going to be a certain amount of swelling. Um, ways that we address swelling are uh, compression. It's very important. The resting and the elevation I mentioned, but also anti-inflammatories and limiting your activities. Compliance is really important after any digital surgery because of these factors. It's different than having surgery if you've ever had knee surgery, hip surgery, back surgery. It's The feet are entirely different. Um, just because obviously anatomy, but because of where they are and because we weight bear every day. So compliance is really important. It's important to wear your shoe when you're supposed to wear your shoe um, or your boot, to wear compression and to listen to your body and your physician. So what to expect furthermore, um, mobility of the joints around where you had surgery increases over time. So those initial post-op weeks, you expect to have a lot of swelling. All the toes are somewhat pushed together because of all the swelling. So sometimes I find patients can get concerned or it's concerning because my issue was my second toe that I had fixed, but now my third and fourth toe, I can't move them because I'm so swollen. That will increase over time and it's expected as you're recovering and swelling subsides. Physical therapy I mentioned is essential for recovery and returning to activities. The amount of physical therapy that you need and when it will be instituted depends on the time you are immobilized. It depends on how you progress and just the procedure overall. But as you can imagine, the longer you are mobilized, the longer you go without putting weight down on your foot, the more uh, therapy you need because you get a major imbalance between the muscles and the tendons. So the main goal of physical therapy is to restore balance, to increase function, and to alleviate pain. So that really 
was a, a broad and yet brief overview of, of the digital deformities, hammer toes, and bunions. So just to summarize really quick, I'll go over these little points and then I'm happy to take any questions and also thank everybody for tuning in. So just to summarize, digital deformities, painful toes present in many different ways, but almost always there's irritation from rubbing in shoes and there's pain at one or two or all of the surrounding joints. What causes this? There are many factors that can cause a bunion or a hammer toe. Typically it's genetics, but outside factors are really important to consider, such as your shoes. It's important not to wear narrow and ill-fitting shoes because it uh, makes you more likely to develop these deformities. Physical exam is very important. Um, not just the actual physical aspect of it, but diagnostic studies. X-rays are essential. Not only should you um, have an exam where your foot is observed in a weight-bearing position and a not weight bearing position, meaning you're standing or not, but also your X-rays must be standing in order to truly assess the joints. Conservative treatment should always be considered first, but um, it is less helpful when you have a progressive deformity uh, because the bones and the joints are involved. Orthotics are really beneficial and key um, for preventing bunions, for protecting bunions and hammer toes. And also, even if you have bunion surgery, orthotics really are key and important in keeping that proper alignment of the foot. Surgery usually requires bone removal um, and there are varying, varying, pardon me, recovery times. I just included this picture because this is a pretty proud severe bunion. So a bunion itself tends to present with pain on the side of the foot here, also known as hallux abducto valgus. There are also hammer toe deformities. Um, there are the three main types of hammer toes I mentioned. You may see a bunion with or without hammer toes or a hammer toe with or without bunions. Shoes are key. This is a picture of not great shoes. They're super narrow and pointy but I wanted to include it because it also had this um, bunion sleeve and pad. This is a toe spacer with a gel pad on the side of it. Um, they have many different devices out there, like I said. And then this is just somewhat demonstrating how orthotics really do help reposition our feet. If you have knock knees like this or that uh, rotation of the knees there, then you put extra pressure because your center of gravity is off towards the medial side of the foot. That causes rolling in of the foot and if you get a good orthotic in place, that center of gravity, which is demonstrated to be angled here, becomes nice and aligned. So that is it for me. I, again, want to thank everybody for tuning in, um, and I'm happy to answer any questions that anybody may have. The question or the statement is, you spoke of bunion in terms of degree of pain. I have a large bump, but no pain. Do you have any recommendations for that? So. I did show that picture on bunions in terms of degrees of, of or I, I mentioned a bunion in terms of severity. So uh, that can be severity of pain or severity of structure. So you might have a really large bump and not have any pain. Um, if that is the case, it, it depends on many factors. If you certainly are somebody that knows that you can't have surgery or you don't want to have surgery, I completely understand that. I would say my focus would be towards prevention and preventing progression of that deformity. So the other aspect of this is if you're somebody that has some sort of deformity and you don't have pain, should you treat it? That's something that is commonly talked about with me and patients and just in general in medicine. If it's not broke, don't fix it, um, is a saying you know that we hear all the time. <clears throat> but specifically with this, you kind of have to approach it in the attitude of prevention versus addressing pain. So I certainly would never push surgery on somebody that has no pain on their bunion. Um, but if you wanted to discuss the progression of bunions and perhaps how to prevent hammer toes because the bunion may be pushing against other toes, then certainly we would discuss surgical measures together. But my recommendation to you um, would be to focus on prevention of that bunion progressing and that's by wearing good shoes and possibly some orthotics in your shoes just to take that extra pressure off of that bunion. There's nothing that can be done to take that that large bump away but you can certainly try to prevent that bump from increasing by wearing good shoes, um, wearing orthotics, taking pressure off of it. So another question I have here is uh, we are approaching summer and the tendency is to go barefoot 
They also do yoga, but wonder how beneficial it is to go barefoot and are flip-flops fat. So there's a lot of controversy if you do any research on barefoot versus being in shoes. Ultimately, shoes are really important because they protect our feet, not just realign the joints. So I do encourage wearing shoes and not going barefoot. Um, are flip-flops bad? Yes, they are, and no, it depends. Not all flip-flops are created equal. Um, flip-flops in general tend to be non-supportive and tend to cause more splaying of the foot because there's no protection on the outside of the joints, if that makes sense. When you step, your feet splay, so it just allows for more splaying of the toes. There are many types of flip-flops out there that are better than others. Um, if there is a, a flip-flop or a sandal that has arch support in it, definitely above those kind of standard uh, rubber flip-flops we tend to wear. Um, brands that, that really have good supportive flip-flops are or sandals are Birkenstocks. Um, also, there's a brand that I'm constantly recommending. It's called Bionic. Uh, kind of, it, it's Bionic, but with a V. So Bionic, um, the brand itself makes shoes, all types of shoes, dress shoes, sneakers, sandals that provide uh, good support and structure for the feet. Along with regular inside foot bunions on both feet, I have developed bunions on the outside of both feet. I've looked it up and I think it's called Taylor's bunions. That is actually true. So there are bunions technically on the outside of the foot. Um, you, if you think about the foot structure here, and I have this picture up so you can somewhat see here where we have our smiley and happy face, the, the middle part of our foot, of our body, is where you have a traditional bunion, the hallux abducto valgus, but you certainly can get splaying of the joint on the outside of the foot as well, um, called a Taylor's bunion. So for that being said, just like with hammer toes and just like with the traditional bunion that I mentioned, in order to take pressure off of that and prevent it from recurring, um, <clears throat> I would recommend good inserts in your shoes and just wearing good inserts in general. Um, do you have a type slash brand of shoe you recommend, example or recommendation for walking shoes? So traditionally, um, with walking shoes, there are several brands that are recommended. There's New Balance. New Balance structurally tends to have a little more depth to the shoe, which gives you more support. Um, within all shoe brands, I will mention, there are good and bad models. So New Balance traditionally has really good um, supportive shoes, Asics, also Brooks, Saucony is also really good. Um, the shoes that I tend to steer patients away from, and nothing against Nike or Adidas, but they, they don't always have the most support to them. Within their shoe line though, there are shoes that are more supportive than others. So the best rule of thumb for patients that I give is one, you wanna make sure there's some structure to it. If you can pick that shoe up off the shelf and just fold it and bend it, it's not doing anything for you. So you want it to have structure. The other thing is you want it to have some depth to it. So it doesn't need to be a high top all the way around your ankle, but you certainly want it to give some support around the ankle so that you're not compensating in the feet. Um, another question is, is there any age limit for surgery? Technically, there's not an age limit, but age does certainly dictate what procedure may be done. Not only age, but activity level. So for somebody that is of advanced age that perhaps doesn't have a high activity level, doing a large reconstructive type surgery per se might not be indicated for that person. The other thing to consider with age is the bone quality and the bone stock. So there's certainly not an age limit for surgery. However, the age um, and the quality of bone will dictate what procedure should be done. So um, another question is, is it common to have claw toes and loss of fat pad in the ball of the foot? Yes occurring um, at, and together at older age and in association with diabetes. Um, yes, that is really common. Um, as we age, the, the fat pad on the bottom of our feet, on the balls of our feet, starts to atrophy or disappear. So as that happens, you get more prominent knuckle bones on the bottom of the feet, and that can cause the digits to contract or as the digits contract like this, the knuckles become more proud on the bottom and wear away the fat pad. Definitely with age that happens because fat pad is reduced with age. Asking, are you, 
are we in St. Clair Medical Building? Yes, we are at St. Mary's. That's where our office is. Um, and where do you perform your procedures? So procedures wise, procedures can be performed in one of two places at our surgery center or a surgery center, but um, we operate and I operate at uh, Mercer County Surgery Center um, or at a hospital. So either way it can be done. Um, it can be done, it's always done as an outpatient, but it can be done at either type of facility and it really doesn't dictate at all the recovery period. You can do the same operations at a surgery center as you can in the hospital. And just because it's in the hospital certainly does not mean that it needs to be an overnight stay. Um, it almost always is an outpatient uh, procedure, whether you're addressing hammer toes, bunions, or both of them. Can overlapping toes next to big toe be remedied without bunion surgery? So yes, they can. It certainly depends on uh, your foot and the structure of it. Um, sometimes it is important not only to address the crossover toe or the overlapping toe, it's important to address the bunion as well because the bunion may be the driving force of that overlapping toe. That's not always the case though. So it would certainly depend on your x-rays and your physical exam, but yes, you can do an isolated overlapping toe surgery. That certainly can happen. So one person mentioned that they've purchased and used um, a brand called Airtex Shoes, A-E-R-T-E-X <clears throat> inserts, um, their shoe inserts, pardon me, and that they've been working for them and were asking if I was familiar with that brand. I have heard of that brand um, and I'm not, super familiar, but I've definitely heard of the name of that. There are many brands um, of inserts over the counter that are excellent. Um, that is a brand that I do recommend exploring. There's two other brands, one of which is Spenco and the other one is Power Steps. They are all very good traditional um, inserts that um, give you good support and you don't have to worry as much of that about that take out of the box factor where you need to determine is it cushion only or is it a real structured insert. Um, those brands are really good. I think that that is it. I don't see any other questions. I do want to just thank everybody again for participating today and also apologize about my itchy throat, um, but I hope it was informative and I'd be so happy to see anybody in office or answer any questions. Please feel free to reach out anytime and also thanks to Jen for hosting us today. Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Collins. Always good to hear your discussions. They're always so full and informative of information. So I thank you for taking the time to educate us on hammer toes and bunions. Um, if anyone does have any questions or would like to schedule an appointment with Dr. Collins, on your screen, you should see where you can call 855-896-0444 to schedule an appointment, or you can go to our website at www.mbortho.com. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. We look forward to seeing you next time. Again, thank you, Dr. Collins, and we'll hope to see you soon. Thank you.